Thank you. And I, uh, I appreciate that I'm the only thing standing between you and the basketball game tonight. So, go woo. Everything that we know about treating heart attack, we've learned in my lifetime. And as a cardiologist who's been involved with the development of those life-saving techniques, I have a sense of pride in what's been accomplished. And I'd like to share a little bit of that story with you today. 1953 was the year I was born. And if you'd had a heart attack that year, there would have been a 50-50 chance that you would have actually made it to the hospital. Once you were admitted, you would have been put to bed rest. And by bed rest, I'm talking six weeks because we felt that it was too much stress on the heart even to do normal activities like walking, brushing your teeth, bathing yourself. During that six weeks, you would have become uh, deconditioned. You would have developed bed sores. And there was still a 30% chance that you would not have made it out of the hospital. In the early 60s, we learned that the reason most people died of heart attacks was because their heart went out of rhythm and it stopped. When I was in elementary school, we learned that if we put patients in coronary care units, monitored their heart rhythms, we could identify that when it went out of rhythm and we could save the patient's life. The next big advance didn't happen until I was in high school. I didn't have anything to do with those first two. But by the time I entered high school, I had decided I wanted to be a cardiologist. So from here on out, the history I sort of own. In that year, we, dis we discovered that you could actually thread a little plastic tube up the vein in the leg, inject dye, and take pictures of the blood vessels around the heart. And we discovered that there were cholesterol plaques and there were blockages that were leading to interruption of the blood flow. And that's what was causing the heart attacks. And we developed coronary bypass surgery where we could actually go around those blockages and restore the blood flow. That was a, that was a huge advance. But later, about 10 years later, we discovered that we didn't really need to do surgery. We could just put a balloon in there and actually blow up that blockage. And it would have the same effect as bypassing it. There have been a couple of refinements on that technique. About 10 years after that, when I was leaving St. Louis to go to Southern Missouri to practice, we learned that about 50%, I'm sorry, 30% of patients who, who get a balloon surgery have a collapse of the blood vessel again. And we discovered that if we put a metal stent in there, a wire cage to hold the blood vessel open, that we could keep the blood flow going. But still, about 5% of patients, even with that stent, developed blockage. So by the time I came back to Worcester 10 years ago, I was involved with treating patients with coated stents. You put a, a drug, a me medicine on the stent. It gradually dis diffused into the tissue. And that kept that patient's own body from destroying that stent and making it collapse again. Today, we have several things on the horizon that are even more remarkable. There's a very good chance that we can actually print new organs using 3D printers. We have genetic techniques that we can use to restore the normal functioning of areas of the heart muscle that are scarred by previous heart attack. And we're learning about individualized medicine where we can actually tailor the kind of medication that we use to the patient's own individual genetics. Those are going to be huge advances. And I'm going to see most of them because they're coming so fast. We can be real proud of the fact that we've decreased the mortality for heart attacks from the 30% it was back in 1960 to barely 5% now. That's been pretty steady over the last 10 years. We take a lot of pride in that, and we tend to pat ourselves on the back. And this is a quote that was taken from an interview recently of one of the founding fathers of cardiology. Clearly, coronary disease is a scourge, and it's the biggest scourge that we have in the last half of the last century. I'm not quite sure that we can say we have defeated it or humbled it. 
but I can say that we were there to see it. Well, if that was the end of the story, it wouldn't be appropriate for this venue. About 1986, I became, I'm sorry, I became aware that, that this was probably not the end of the story. And in this year, I can say that we still have the problem with this, as evidenced by the fact that, that heart disease is still the leading cause of death, causing 600,000 deaths every year and a million and a half heart attacks every year. Overall, we really haven't changed too much what happens to patients before they go to the hospital. Once they get there, we can do remarkable things to restore blood flow and to decrease the chance that they're going to die in the hospital. But as many as half patients that have heart attacks are still dying before they get to the hospital. We have tremendous costs in this country relating to the cost of heart disease. And about 20% of our healthcare dollar is spent on taking care of heart, vic heart attack victims. If you look at the number of patients that have preventable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, kidney function problems, it's estimated that 80% of what we spend on health care is due to disease that didn't have to happen at all. This is very expensive care. And we spend more than any country in the world on our health care. We spend twice as much as Japan does. There isn't a single developed country in the world that spends close to what we spend. And it's getting worse. As a percentage of our total economy, we now spend 18% of every dollar on health care. That's estimated to go up to 26% over the next 20 years. The sad reality of it is that what we're getting for that money is not what we intend to get. We rank 29th of all countries in how long we live. Japan spends half what we do, and yet they have a much better life expectancy. And the chances that their babies will live is four times greater than ours. I don't know if you saw in the paper a couple of days ago, they released figures on on infant mortality for the states for the last couple of years. And um, Ohio ranked 48 out of 50 states in infant mortality. And yet, we spend probably more than most other states in terms of heart care. We have several of the country's best heart care facilities in Ohio. And yet, our babies are dying more than any other state. This is going to get worse. These are projections. What's going to happen over the next 20 years? Over 40% of everybody in the country will have some form of heart disease if things go the way they're headed. And this is what it's going to cost us to take care of it. Now, this slide doesn't have the impact that a slide of a mutilated elephant has. It's, it's no less obscene. Imagine what we could do with $800 billion every year. Why is it going to cost so much? Well, there's a big pig in a pie slot. We've got all these baby boomers that are just beginning to be old enough to, to have heart disease. We're doing better with maintaining life. We're extending the life of patients that have heart disease. They have one stent. They have a bypass surgery. They have another stent. They're living longer. More and more of our kids are becoming at risk of developing heart trouble in the future. We've got a huge epidemic of obesity among our youth. And in fact, this is the first generation in history that is expected to live a shorter lifespan than their parents. We tend to focus in cardiology on drugs and on devices, on doing things, putting stents, doing surgery, expensive medication. There's reasons for this. It pays better. 
until we start reimbursing our doctors for talking to their patients, holding their hands, sitting with them, discussing their health. We're going to have more physicians wanting to go into areas where they can be paid more money to do less work and still get home by 5 o'clock. And we're not training our new doctors in how to prevent disease. We're training them in how to cure disease or to treat disease. We're not training health care workers. We're training disease care workers. This is a scary thing in terms of the international effect of the cardiology treatment that we have. We, we are exporting our lifestyle to developing countries. And individuals in these countries are literally dying to live like we do. This, this, there's a reason why major health care entities are building new hospitals in China, in the Middle East. That's where the disease is going to be. And it's not a revolutionary thought to do a uh, business plan if you're a healthcare industry. All you have to do is adopt the fast food industry's business plan and delay it by about 10 years, and you'll be successful. Well, maybe our pride is just a little premature. It's really more arrogance than it is pride. So how does it manifest? Well, first of all, the whole notion of being able to win the war on a disease implies that we have control over nature. We, we haven't done we're very well with tuberculosis or malaria. How do, do we think we're going to do the same with coronary disease? And the metaphor of a war is rather self-serving it legitimizes the whole effort. The only people that win fighting wars are the people that make the bullets and the people that get the contracts to clean up the carnage. We spend $800 billion, or we'll spend $800 billion on the care of heart disease victims by the time it's over. How can we justify that in terms of a cost to society when we could be using that money for so many other important purposes? And how can we disregard the importance of, of preventing all of this? There has been a religion that has developed around the whole notion of what constitutes valid research, valid science. And this involves the randomized trial. There are physicians who emphasize that the only way that we can truly know something, if there's something better than something else, is if we compare the two. So we design these trials of hundreds of thousands of patients to be able to prove that one expensive treatment is infinitesimally better than another expensive treatment. What we really need to do is to open our eyes to other evidence It's not good enough to be the best at pulling the victims out of the river. The heart attack victim needs our help, but we would be much more helpful if we have the courage to go upstream and find out who's thrown them in the river to begin with. And let's take the metaphor just a little further. What we do now is take those victims, we treat them, and we throw them back in the same river and let somebody else worry about them downstream. Worcester changed my life when I was here, and it changed my life again about eight years ago when I went to this uh, symposium here. This was a wellness symposium that uh, brought together several speakers who have an interest in nutrition and in, in mindful eating, and specifically in the, the use of a whole food, unprocessed, plant-based diet. And there's good evidence of why that works. Uh, I'll just go through these very quickly. There, there are native populations in China, uh, hunter-gatherer populations that have a very low incidence of heart disease. And there's a reason for that. They have very low uh, intake of animal protein, very high intake of plant proteins. 
there are there are studies that look at the the uh, migration of patient, of people from, uh, for example, uh, Japan, to Hawaii to the United States, and show that with the same genetic makeup, there is a dramatic increase in the likelihood that they're going to have heart disease. There are studies looking at temporarily uh, depriving patients, depriving populations of access to calories, for example, during the war. Uh, and those studies show that there is a dramatic drop in the heart disease rates for several years after that period of relative deprivation. And finally, there's some interventional studies where we've actually been able to look to see what the effect is of a plant-based diet on heart patients. Some of those studies are getting some traction. Now, here's one that really impressed me. Um, Dr. Esselstyn took patients that were told basically there was nothing that could be done for them. Uh, there was no surgery, there were no drugs. They basically had to go home to die. And those patients were very open to the notion that there might be something that they can do for themselves to change that game. And so what he did was take those patients and he spent hours with them teaching them a better way, teaching them a new way to eat. Basically, it was a, a plant-based diet that was very low in added oil because we know that, for example, if you go to McDonald's and eat a Big Mac, you can measure the change in the way your blood vessels function for hours after that meal. So his hypothesis was that if I take these patients that have no other choice and f have them eat this way, I can change what's going on in their blood vessels. And he found that there was a marked improvement in the amount of chest pain they had, the number of heart attacks they had. We don't frequently talk about nutrition because it's hard. Th this is a list of just some of the diets that are out there now. Most of them are snake oil. But some of them do have some basis in science. And what those have in common is that they're stressing the use of plant-based diet and getting away from processed food, getting away from the high sugar diets that are leading to so much problem with diabetes and obesity. This is a challenge. It's hard to teach patients how to eat right. It's not something that you can do across the room from them while you have one hand on the doorknob and someone else is writing your notes for you. It really takes involvement, it takes time. We don't pay doctors to do that. Uh, in the time it takes me to educate a patient on how to eat and I get reimbursed $50, somebody can do this uh, a coronary stent in the lab and earn several hundred dollars. So where do you think the new talent's going to go. It's not going to go into the office where you have to see patients every 15 minutes and try to make a difference. We're not training our doctors to act that way. We've forgotten how to cook. Uh, that's the biggest challenge that I have when I talk to patients. They have not the slightest idea, idea what to do with a, a, a piece of broccoli. And most of the patients that are most at risk don't have access to the food. It costs too much. They don't have a supermarket close to their home. Their families are so busy, they're working two jobs. We've got grandpa in the house. We've got uh, toddlers in the house as well. How are you going to cook for everybody? Institutional resistance can, can be very subtle from giving you 15 minutes to see a patient to telling you what uh, teaching materials that you can use in your office. There hasn't been much progress in getting patients to eat what we've been telling them for the last 30 years. And there hasn't been a lot of change in what our, go our government recommends. I, I, was, I was appalled when I saw this. That these are the number of adults who are meeting the current guidelines for fruits and vegetables, less than 10% across the board. Children are even worse. We're doing much better on the number of calories we're eating. And we see what effect that's having. I see some hope. And that hope is in the fact that there's tremendous pressure to make healthcare more affordable and to make the effect of the dollars that we're spending accountable. Uh, with all the pro for all the problems that Obamacare has had rolling out, the Affordable Care Act does 
promise to improve access um, by insuring more patients, giving them access to health care. Uh, but it also has, as one of its main goals, is to make the uh, treatments that we're doing accountable, that we have to show that they work and that there's benefit from them. It's not enough just to say, we're going to reimburse you for anything that you do. You have to prove that it works and that it makes a difference. More and more people are using social media to communicate with regard to health, with regard to what they're eating. And there's much more support now than there used to be. What was a cult five years ago is now a movement. And there's still enough time to get in on the movement. It, it's, it's still cool. Medicare just approved uh, reimbursement for a program of a plant-based diet along with an intensive treatment uh, program of, of rest, relax, uh, meditation, social support, and exercise. So, so our government is finally recognizing that there is science there and that it does support the adoption of a plant-based diet. We're getting endorsements. Bill Clinton uh, is the latest to come out and say that this is the way he's eating. Uh, just last month, uh, Kaiser Permanente, the largest HMO in the country, uh, endorsed a plant-based diet for their population. And uh, in, in the article that they published, they are proposing that they use as one of the criteria to, de to decide if their physicians are meeting guidelines is, are their physicians teaching their patients about this diet? We're, we're having some insurance incentives too. If you, if you lose weight, if you exercise, you're gonna get a, a decrease in what you're paying. There's also another perfect storm of aligned values. And when I talk about this, this nutrition to patients, I find myself using these words. And I find myself aligning myself with environmentalists, and social activists, um, urban planners, uh, local gardeners. There are a number of ways to be mindful about how we live. We can be mindful about what we eat. We can be mindful about the musical instruments we buy. We can be mindful about the career that we choose. I think that the interdependence of those different ways of being mindful is summed up best by this quote here. We're talking about the suffering of living beings. Patients with chronic disease suffer. Animals that die at our pleasure so that we can have meat on our table for every meal suffer. Um, our planet is suffering because of the choices that we make. We need to make better choices. So I spent the first 20 years of my career um, acting like most cardiologists do, thinking that disease is something that you conquer. I want to spend the, the next few years looking at ways that I can incorporate new ideas about health care rather than disease care. One of the things that intrigues me as a, as a scientist is whether or not there is strong evidence that the more you go out on the spectrum uh, towards plants and away from animal protein, is there a continuation of the benefit? Is, is it a... a, a, a a balance that you need to strike? Or, or is it just an all or nothing thing? <clears throat> this is sadly the current situation with healthcare in, in the food industry in our country. It's time for a new paradigm. And, and here's one that's been around for 2,500 years. It, um, it's a good start. Thank you. <laughs>